All right, today is July 26th, 2020. And today's message is going to be on a personal vein. Because today it's, it's my spiritual birthday. It was 59 years ago today that I gave my heart to the Lord and he saved me. And I don't make a, a big public deal, you know, all the time on that one. Uh, on a personal level, I do. But it just so happened that today on my birthday it happened to be Sunday and it happened to be, uh, you know, a day that we're going ahead and putting the church thing out here. Uh, next year, it, my birthday will not come on a Sunday, and so I probably won't make a big deal of it, you know, in a public way. But today, I did want to acknowledge the Lord and what he did for me 59 years ago. So I'm going to start with just a little teeny bit of a background. It's going to be a, a testimony <clears throat> slash what happened on the day that I got saved type thing. And the reason I do this is that, and the reason the Bible encourages people to testify, and, and so, testifying just simply means you relate <clears throat> what happened to you on a personal level when you got saved. And everybody's story is different. Some people get saved in a big church meeting. Some people get saved in a Billy Graham revival. Or some people get saved in a, in a house. Some people get saved, you know, wherever. Everybody's got a different story. And everybody's got a different background and a journey to that story. So I want to take just a couple of minutes and go through on my background so that you can kind of relate as to how I got to where uh, I am today. I had always believed in a God. I was never an atheist as such, even as a little kid. I think most little kids, obviously, they come out the gate and they believe in God. Uh, it's not a saving belief, but they believe in God. And add to that, I was baptized in the, the Episcopal Church, which is basically the Church of England. And in my later years, I was baptized again in the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ, their main focus on getting saved is that you have to be baptized. Baptism and salvation go hand in hand. And so, in my heart of hearts, now I'm, you know, late teens as such, 16, 17 years old, I've always believed in a God. I had been baptized now twice, baptized in the Church of England, the Episcopal Church, and baptized in the Church of Christ, you know, one sprinkled and the other dunked. So I, I kind of felt safe. I kind of felt like I was uh, pretty well covered here on that basis. And then... Timing is everything. For me to get up to Hume Lake on a certain time, to hear a certain preacher who at that time lived on the in Alabama, rural Alabama, a little town called Baymanette, God had to orchestrate two sets of circumstances here. He had to get me from where I was to Hume Lake and get Pete, that's Pete Ruckman, to get him from where he was to Hume Lake at the same time. Mine was a little complicated in that after graduation, me and my buddy, we went down to Mexico. We were gonna spend the entire summer down there. We had no jobs. Uh, we didn't have to really get back to school until sometime in September or so. August or September, whatever it was. And so we had, you know, three months, basically. And we were just going to bum it around in Mexico. And we did. But God had a timetable. He had to get me back by a certain date. And so when I look back on it, you know, years and years later, I can see the hand of God moving. We had trouble with the Jeep. That trouble with the Jeep would have a 
start and stop. We, we would just go down, we would sleep on the beaches, we would sleep under the stars, we would just goof off and have a good old time. But that leisure time, that longevity that we had, we thought we had the, the three, you know, two and a half, three months down there. It began to get messed up by the fact that we were having trouble with the Jeep. I didn't have hardly any money. Bob didn't have very much money. We couldn't really tap our folks for that much money. Uh, you know, we're, we're 18 years old. We're on our own. We're footloose and fancy free. Uh, man up and just, you know, don't call me, I'll call you type thing. And so in the middle of Mexico, we're down in La Paz, which is a few miles above Cabo. The Jeep is in a shop. We're tapped out. We've got just barely enough money to get the Jeep on a cattle boat, basically, a barge, to get it from La Paz over to Mazatlan. From Mazatlan, then we had to come back up the house. We had, like I said, we had no money. We were completely tapped out by the time we hit Mazatlan. We're, <clears throat> we're sleeping on the beaches there. We're just goofing off. We're trying to get home. We can't spend a night any place because we don't have enough money for a room. Bob had a gas credit card, which allowed us to get gas on the way home. Food-wise, all we lived on was candy bars and chips because in those days they didn't have the AM, PMs like they got now where you can get, you know, it's basically a grocery store in there. So in those days, the, the, the gas stations, they, they'd have chips and, and candy, and that'd be about it. So in San Diego, the Jeep finally conks out totally. Well, all right, we're across the border, we're okay. I had just got a ticket coming from Mexicali over to uh, the San Diego. We're close enough, Bob calls his dad, his dad comes down, tows the Jeep, back home. This is a Tuesday night. I called my girlfriend that night, let her know I was home. And she says, oh, well, you got to come to church tomorrow. I said, what are you talking about? Got to come to church tomorrow. She says, yeah, we have to sign up for youth camp. I said, youth camp? Are you out of your mind? I don't need a Bible youth camp. That's all I need was to sit there for a week with a whole bunch of, you know, goody two-shoe Christian type people. I didn't want to go. She begged me and begged me. I said, look, I've got no money. I, I'm tapped out. I don't have a job. I don't have anything. And she says, oh, no, no, no. I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it. Oh, I thought she wouldn't let it go. So that's Tuesday night. Wednesday, I come over to First Baptist Church, sign up for youth camp. And we're taking off on Friday. Had to sign up, had to have the money in on that Wednesday night. That was that timing aspect, that had God let us or allowed us one single solitary extra night any place in that six-week, two-month period, I never would have made it back. I would have got home on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever. I never would have gone to youth camp. God orchestrated that whole trip so that I got back exactly with just enough time to make that phone call and her being in a mood that she insisted that I go to youth camp with her. She'd pay. That was my end of it. The orchestration that God had to go with Pete. Pete was an evangelist. An evangelist is a preacher who goes from church to church to church to church. So he'll be there for a week, uh, 10 days, three days, whatever it happens to be. Then he'll go to the next church. So he's not a pastor as such that he sits there and he does the baptisms and the funerals and the weddings and all that stuff. He's just a speaker. He goes from church to church. Pete at that time was preaching when he felt like it in the biggest churches in America. I'm talking mega church for those days, you know, 5,000, 6,000 auditorium churches. But his heart and his love was just rural street preaching. He'd go out on a street corner, set up his easel, 
put his drawing board up there, and he'd draw a picture and preach. There's no money in that. His wife was so frustrated with him, knowing that if he wanted to, he could orchestrate his ministry so that all he did was preach in mega churches. You know, thousands and thousands of dollars a week he could make. But he felt in his heart that God wanted him to be basically a street preacher at that point. So one week he'd be preaching at Temple Baptist Church in Detroit or Lachlan Baptist Church in, in Cincinnati or so forth. Four, five, six, eight thousand people in a lump. And then that Monday afternoon, he's back in a holler someplace in the middle of Kentucky uh, preaching to 12 people. And his wife just, she couldn't take it. So he gets home from a meeting one time. He walks into the door. She's standing there with her suitcase in her hand. He's, and she says, I'll see you later. I'm out of here. I can't take this anymore. He's got four kids sitting in the house between the ages of two and eight. Four kids. She walks out the door. He goes nuts. He has a breakdown, basically. What am I going to do? I can't take care of four kids. I can't minister. I can't preach. She's gone. My reputation's shot. My ministry's shot. What am I going to do? So he gets on the phone and he calls a couple of the big churches that he had lined up. He says, I'm sorry, I can't make it. And they said, well, why can't you make it? And he explains what's going on. My wife's leaving me. She's divorcing me. And in that day and age in the church, a divorced a divorce for a preacher, that was the kiss of death. That was it. You were out on your ears. And one of the big mega church guys that he was talking to said, look, I'll tell you what, I can get you a gig out in California. You spend a week or so, drive out there with your kids, just relax, take your mind off everything, preach the week at Bible camp, take another week getting back. And after that, Let's see how things settle out. You, you can't make a decision now in the emotional state that you're in. So just go ahead and do that. And Pete agreed. So he says, all right, I'll go out there. So here you have these two divergent circumstances. Me and my timing to get from Mexico, boom, to Hume Lake. Pete, it took a divorce. And him being stuck with four kids, as it were, to get there. But now we're there. We left First Baptist on a Friday evening. We got up to Hume Lake early, early, early Saturday morning. The first meeting as such, Bible class or study or message, whatever you want to call it, was on Saturday afternoon. And the first time I heard Pete, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I, I was familiar with churches. I had been to church off and on here or there. Uh, I had experimented different churches, everything from the Catholic Church, Church of Christ, Baptist churches, uh, Methodist, Episcopal, just, you know, go down the line. And so I had heard a lot of preachers. The first minute I heard this guy, I said, this is, I, I couldn't get over it. Personality-wise, brains-wise, but mostly I think what got me was the street smart aspect of him. He didn't come off as a holier than thou preacher. He didn't come off as a hoity toity, you know, I've never done anything wrong type guy. He wasn't saved till he was 29 years old. He had been there, done it all. And I listened to him that first time and I was just flabbergasted. I don't really think on this planet, there was another preacher in the world that could have gotten to me the way Pete did. And I think that's why God got him out there and put him through what he did so that God knows that it was gonna take somebody like Pete to get to me. And so I hear him for the first time. So I hear him Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, four days working on me. During that four-day period, after every message, you know, in the evening sessions, they'd have an invitation. 
The invitation is, you know, if you wanted to get saved or if you wanted to rededicate your life or if you wanted to, you know, dedicate your life to being a missionary or uh, being a preacher or something, or if you've screwed up during the year, you want to get your heart back right with God and you want to rededicate yourself. Well, I had heard this term rededicate all week long, you know, for four days. And so it's, it's basically fixed in my head here. And so he gets up on Wednesday night and he says, turn to Revelation chapter 20 and I'll have you turn to Revelation chapter 20. This is my saving text. I think every, most people who are saved, they, they were saved when the preacher was preaching a certain message and they might not remember it. It might not be important to you, but it, it, it got me and I've never forgotten it. And this was the passage that he preached on that night. And when Pete preached, like I said, he had a great big, huge easel and a big, you know, drawing thing. And he would use chalk and he would preach the message on the chalkboard. This is what it was. Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. You see a theme here? That theme is getting to me. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this and I think, ah, I've got him now. This is the first mistake he's made all week. He's drawing and he's got the, the, the main focus of the drawing is two pages, you know, it's, it's like a book, you know, page one, page two, up there. And on the first page, he's writing all these things as he's preaching, you know, lying, stealing, adultery, murder, you know, he's just going through the line. Other page is blank. And he's doing all these things and he's reiterating over and over and over again. They were judged every man according to their works. Well, I'm 18 at the time, and I lived an interesting life. I hadn't killed anybody. So I'm, I'm kind of going through the, the checklist of my own here when it talks about works. And as he's writing this stuff on the board, I said, well, I, I haven't killed anybody. Um, most of the others, a lot of the others I had, the stealing and the, you know, bunch of the other ones I had done but I hadn't killed anybody. And so he has us flip over to John 3, 3, and I'll just, I'll just say that one. When Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and Jesus says to him, he says, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. You must. It's not you should, or I advise it, or I recommend it. Ye must be born again. And then Nicodemus goes into the dumb speech, you know, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he get back into his mother's womb and blah, blah, blah? But Jesus said, look, knock it off. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a spiritual rebirth and you need it. And so now all this, I'm, I'm trying to process all this stuff. I know that when it came to work wise, you know, the, 
every man judged according to his works, ah, I'm on shaky ground. But shaky ground enough to warrant going to hell for? I was, the jury was still out on that one. I wasn't really buying that as such. So good works, bad works. Yeah, I'm, I'm in that mix there. I knew I had a whole lot of bad works. I had a few good works, but I knew that, you know, the old traditional thing that the, the people say, well, when you die, God's going to take all your good works and put them in a lump and put all your bad works and put them in a lump, you know, on a scale. And if the good works outweigh the bad works, you get to go to heaven. If the bad works outweigh the good works, you get to go to hell. That was kind of my thought. I, I kind of thought that was basically a fair and equitable thing that the way God worked. You know, the old scale system. Then Pete, he, he just didn't give up. He has this turn to Matthew chapter 7. And of course, I had no clue what he's, where he's going, what he's saying or what he's trying to do here. Matthew chapter 7. So I turn over there with him. And he says, let's start reading at verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Ooh, I thought, wow. Just a second, you mean not every... People are referring to him as Lord, and they're, they're doing things here. They're doing his will or not doing his will. And I'm now I can feel this creepy, creeping feeling start going up my spine for the first time now. That is what we call conviction. Now I'm sitting there and the thought process have gone from me trying to rationalize this or justify that or figure this out or figure that out. For the first time, I felt an impending sense of doom come over me. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about good people here. I'm thinking, holy moly, if I'm on that scale system, I'm on shaky ground here. So he goes on. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Well, I knew I would never prophesied in his name. I was never that good. And in thy name have cast out devils? Are you out of your mind? I wasn't in that league or that category. Prophesying, casting out devils, good grief. I was, I was, oh, I was out of it. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. Well, right about now, I'm in sensory overload. I mean, I knew now on the basis of what I'm reading here and what he's preaching, I'm toast. I, I, there's no way I can compete on this thing. That scale thing, forget it. I'm dead in the water with that. The many wonderful works, forget it. I'm dead in the water. Doing his will, referring to him as Lord, Lord, and so forth. I'm dead in the water. Verse 23, and then will I, Jesus speaking, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Well, he's coming kind of getting close to the end of his message at this point. He's got all these Sins written on the left-hand side of the page. The blank side of the page, or the right side of the page is still blank. He hasn't put anything on there. So he says, pointing to the page with all the, the sins and so forth, he says, do you realize that not one of these 
sends anybody to hell. Murder, adultery, fornication, lying, stealing, blah, blah, blah. He says, not one of them will send anybody to hell. Well, right now, my, my brain is so addled. My, my thought process is so screwed up. I, I don't know what he's talking about at this point. Then he begins to write for the first time on the right-hand side of the page. And he writes, the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, that is the only one that will put you in hell. You don't go to hell for murder. You don't go to hell for lying. You don't go to hell for stealing. You don't go to hell for adultery. You go to hell because you refuse to accept Jesus as your personal savior, period. And he says, don't guess about it. Don't think about it. Don't wonder about it. You're either saved or you're not. You know in your heart of hearts if you're saved or not. He says, don't put it off. And then he, he quotes Proverbs 27, verse one. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. He says, some of you are thinking, oh, I'll do it later. Or I'll wait until I get some more good works under my belt. Or I'll wait until I you know, sowed my wild oats or whatever it happens to be. He said, look, and he's quoting Proverbs 27. He says, boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. In other words, you know, I could walk out and get hit by a bus right then. I don't know. Piano could fall on my head. Just fill in the blank. You don't know when you're going to go. You don't know when your time's up. So don't guess. Don't wonder. Don't assume. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Get saved now. Then they break into the, you know, the invitation song, Just As I Am Without One Plea. And I heard that. Boom. I slapped my songbook together. I literally threw the songbook down the aisle. And I walked forward and he just kind of motioned me to the back room back there. The piano player had barely started the thing. Usually it takes five, 10 minutes and 20 verses of the song to get anybody to finally move forward. And then once somebody goes and somebody else has the guts to go and so forth, I was down there so quick. The piano player had barely started. Pete was shocked. He didn't know what to do. There was nobody in the back room to deal with me that, that he had led me to. So I'm sitting back there in the back room by myself. Nobody was ready. Took everybody by surprise. And then the old devil starts to work. He says, what an abject idiot you just made of yourself. What a spectacle. What an idiot. And I think, well, by then, some young guy comes in. He's probably an assistant pastor or something, youth leader or whatever. He looked to be, you know, I'm 18. He looked to be about 21, 22 years old or so. And he says, what can I do for you today? You know, all cheery and happy and, you know, so forth. Bless his heart. He didn't know any better. And the only term that I knew that I had heard all week with all the, these kids going forward and stuff was that term, rededicate. And so he says, what are you here for? And I says, uh, 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 rededicate. He says, oh, good, wonderful. So he sits me down, and now he's going through some verses that have to do with rededication and so forth. And he's about five minutes into this thing. Door open. It's just the two of us there. The door opens, and some older, I'd say he was probably 55, 60 years old, but to me, at 18, he looked ancient. And so this guy comes in, distinguished looking, you know, silver hair, aquiline nose. I mean, just chiseled features. I mean, he was, he was a man's man. And he opened the door and he just stood there and he looked at the, the worker that was with me and he looked at me. And he says, uh, what are you guys up to? And I'm, I'm so tongue-tied right now. I'm so emotionally overloaded. I just sit there like an idiot. I don't say anything. And the young kid says, well, uh, uh, Brother Ron here, uh, he's come to uh, rededicate his life to the Lord. And he just shook his head. He says, really? 
He says, I'll take it from here. And so the kid took the clue. He got out. And now it's just me and this gentleman. Came to find out later, his name is Artel Stewart. And he was a preacher up around Bellflower or Arcadia or, or someplace up there. And so he looks at me and he says, uh, you're not here for rededication, are you? Well, I, uh, I don't know. He says, you need to get saved. And as soon as he said that, I, I knew the pecking order. I knew exactly what my problem was. I knew exactly that the baptisms that I'd gone through, the sprinklings, the christened in the Church of England, baptized in the Church of Christ, uh, doing God a favor by going to Sunday school every now and then, uh, all this stuff, it didn't mean squat. It was nothing. I says, yeah, I need to get saved. And so he got down there and he opened up the passages on salvation and approximately at nine o'clock at night, July 26th, a Wednesday, 1961, I gave my heart to the Lord. Now, since then, I have never one minute doubted my salvation. God has blessed me with that. Some Christians bless their hearts. They go through periods of time where because circumstances are so bad or their conduct is so bad that they might from time to time doubt whether or not they really are saved. God has blessed me in that I have doubts about a lot of things maybe, but my salvation was never one of them. I've doubted my efficiency for God. I've doubted the things I've done for God. I've doubted the uh, my commitment to God. That There's a million things I've doubted in my life, but I've never doubted my salvation. I have disappointed him. I have let him down. I have frustrated him. I've angered him. But it doesn't affect the relationship. When he said to Nicodemus that night, ye must be born again. That's what the born again experience is. You are born again. And once you are born into this world, you have a relationship with your mom and dad. And that relationship is born of the fact that you are there. You are born. And in the ensuing years of your relationship with your mom or your dad, that can fluctuate. The fellowship, you know, you might do something bad and they're gonna spank you or ground you or take something away. And at that moment, the fellowship is not that great. The relationship never changes. It's still my mom and dad. I'm still the kid. We understand relationships and fellowships. You have an argument with your wife. Well, the fellowship isn't that great for a day or two, maybe. Relationship never changes. And so over the years, when I look back, my fellowship with God has not always been the way it should have been. I have dropped the ball. As I said, I have frustrated him, angered him, disappointed him, and let him down. That's the fellowship part. But the relationship, I am a son of God. I have been born again. I am accepted in the beloved. I am an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, based on that fact that on that day and at that time, I gave my heart to Jesus. It wasn't the baptisms that did it. It wasn't the good things that maybe I did do once in a while. It wasn't the, some of the bad things that I didn't do. It was the fact that I gave my heart to Jesus and accepted him as my savior. I've never wavered on that. 
He has never wavered on that. So I invite you today. Why don't you have the same birthday I've got? That'd be pretty cool. July 26. Mine was 61. Yours can be 2020. So I submit to you. But although I have not kept up my part of this fellowship, I can attest that my Lord and Savior never for one second faltered on his end. I recommend them to you this day. Heavenly Father, the, the emotions that I'm feeling right now, I can't, I can't adequately express. Uh, I've seen some preachers that are so good at taking emotions and, and taking a crowd and just whipping up the, the feelings and so forth. And I, uh, I'm not that good. I can't do that. And I wouldn't purposefully do it as I could. But on a personal level, Father, I want to thank you again for the price that you paid on Calvary, for the loss of the fellowship that you and your dad had to go through when you had to cry those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God had to listen to those words. At that moment, the fellowship between you and your father was severed. But the relationship was never touched. You are the son, he is the father. And by that same token, although through the years, I have let down on the fellowship aspect of our relationship. You never have. And I thank you. That's the biggest idiot thing I could ever say. For what you've given to me, what you mean to me, the best I can come up with, the only thing that I can bring is to simply a simple thank you. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. If I could earn it, I wouldn't be able to keep it. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And by the grace of God, you came in and changed my heart. And for that, Father, I thank you with all my heart. In Jesus' name.